Welcome back. In this segment, we will continue our exploration into the difficult topic of incitement speech, a form of expression that may be legitimately restricted under international human rights law. I will first explain why it is a form of expression that is particularly egregious and dangerous as compared to other kinds of hate speech or extreme speech. I will then highlight some of the key jurisprudence decisions related to incitement speech and to a lesser extent to some form of hate speech. And in conclusion, I will extract from the jurisprudence some of the key elements which are constitutive of uh, incitement speech in order to uh, ground the determination of whether or not we are dealing with incitement speech on a firmer basis given the lack of precision and the contradiction of international provisions. So let's begin. As I have explained in the previous segment, international standards and court have all tended to agree that one form of hate speech is particularly worse than others in terms of its characteristics and impact. It's called incitement speech. In fact, I personally like to really distinguish the two and not to bring incitement under the label of hate speech. So incitement speech and hate speech. Incitement speech is considered as particularly dangerous or egregious because of what some scholars have described as a triangle of hatred. And you're going to see that triangle on your screen. So what, what does this triangle represent? It shows that there is a speaker, that there is a target group, and that there is an audience. What does the speaker do? The speaker calls the audience to action, to take actions against uh, target groups for prescribed result, which may include act of violence, um, as well as discrimination under Article 20. So the triangle of hatred means that there are many actors involved and potentially uh, an actor, the audience, which could impose and which could create great uh, harm on a target group. The audience is uh, specific as compared to a more general form of hate speech that may not be completely directed at one specific um, audience or individual. So what does the international jurisprudence tell us about the crime, crime of incitement? I'm going to focus here on a few decisions to illustrate a possible test for incitement. I will begin with a very extreme uh, case, a case that was dealt with by the International Criminal Tribunal on Rwanda. Now, I think all of you will remember that 20 years ago there was a genocide in Rwanda that resulted in the uh, mass murders, executions of uh, millions of individuals. In 1996, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, called ICTR, became the first legal institution to hand down a conviction for direct and public incitement to commit genocide in Prosecutor versus Akayesu. Just to recall that in the case of, of Rwanda, there had been plenty of examples and indeed evidence linking uh, the act of genocide with what some radio stations in particular had done. And I have in mind here a radio called Radio, radio Mil Colin, which was seen as the main actor, a very important actor through which calls uh, for genocide had been made. In that particular case of Akayesu versus Prosecutor, the tribunal insisted on the gravity of public incitement based on the genocide convention drafting history. And here, the, the key word here is public. So the uh, ICTR uh, made a difference between public incitement and private incitement. And it particularly uh, highlighted the fact that public incitement is what needs to be prohibited and is what is particularly uh, dangerous. 
uh, and it's different from uh, other forms of incitement which may occur in a private setting. Direct and public incitement must be defined, according to the tribunal, as directly provoking the perpetrators to commit genocide, whether through speech, shouting or threat uttered in public space or at public gathering, or through the sale of dissemination of written materials uh, in public space or uh, at a public uh, gathering. So, the, the test here is a test of directness. How direct is the call for committing uh, genocide? The incitement assumes a direct form and specifically provoke another to engage in a criminal act. That's what directness is meant. What that implies is, is that more than vague or indirect suggestions must be made in order to constitute direct incitement. It's got to be fairly clear uh, and, and direct. Persons for whom the message is intended immediately should grasp the implication there, thereof of the incitement. In other words, a person that is listening to, um, to the speech should know fairly quickly, fairly directly, that the speech is about a call for, uh, for murder, a call for uh, genocide. The incitement must be unambiguous in its intended context. An ambiguous call for genocide does not meet the direct test which is included in the Genocide Convention. So that's an important decision and one that um, is used actually by lawyers and courts around the world. Now let's look at the UN Human Rights Committee and what does it have to say about incitement. The jurisprudence unfortunately is not as elaborated as one may wish for, but still there are a few lessons that may, may be extracted. First, um, the Human Rights Committee eventually linked restrictions on the basis of incitement to the three-part test provided by Article 19. In other words, the committee has said that there is no contradiction between Article 19 and Article 20. And any kind of restrictions under Article 20 must meet the three-part test of Article 19. So an incitement a form of restrictions must be prohibited by law, must meet legitimate ground, and must be necessary. The Human Rights Committee has also highlighted that one of the legitimate grounds for restrictions under Article 19.3, uh, namely the rights of others, may include the right to be free from incitement, as uh, defined by, by Article 20. So what the committee has tried to do is to integrate Article 19 and Article 20 together and to ease any kind of um, fears over their contradiction. The two articles are well integrated into the jurisprudence and that is very important. Let's uh, look at uh, an important case at the Human Rights Committee level, Ross versus Canada. So Ross was a teacher who in his spare time published anti-Semitic books and pamphlet. The uh, publications and expression were not contrary to the Canadian law, and the authors had never been prosecuted, and indeed, he had never used his uh, writing in the context of his teaching. A Jewish parent whose child attended a school, but not the school where Mr. Ross was teaching, uh, brought a lawsuit and complained to the Human Rights Commission that the school board was in breach of the Human Rights Act by failing to take action against the professor, the author. By so doing, the school board was accused of condoning the views of Mr. Ross. The uh, Human Rights Board investigated the, the, the situation and held that the author's writings and public statement had over many years contributed to, I, I cite, a poison environment within the school district. And they ordered 
the school board to place the author on an unpaid leave of absence for 18 months, to appoint him to a non-teaching position if possible, and if not, to dismiss him after 18 months. The order was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada. Eventually, the author went all the way to the uh, UN Human Rights Committee and alleged that his uh, freedom of expression had been unfairly restricted. What the uh, Human Rights Committee did was in fact to upheld Canada's ruling. The Human Rights Committee agreed that a causal link could be established between the expression of the author and the poison school environment experienced by Jewish children in the school district. So the important uh, factor here is the concept of causal link. Unfortunately, in that particular case, the um, Human Rights Committee did not elaborate much on what that causal link was in that particular case, but it nevertheless uh, highlighted the importance of proving a causal link between an expression and, and a particular threat. Other interesting element of uh, the decisions when you read it is that um, uh, the court, the Human Rights Committee, highlighted the importance of the context. In other words, the expression should not be viewed in isolation. The committee also highlighted the uh, the notion of intention and intent behind the expression. What was the intention of Mr. Ross? It also uh, highlighted the importance of the position of the speaker, in this case, Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross is a school teacher. He has a lot of influence, not only over his classroom, but within his community in general. And uh, the importance of causality that I have already highlighted between the speech and the threat, between the expression and what was at the time indeed a poison school environment. Whether or not that poison school environment could be directly linked to uh, Mr. Ross is another matter. But in any case, the uh, Human Rights Committee did point out that there needed to be a, a causality between the speech and, and the danger or the threat. Let's uh, look at the European Court for Human Rights. As I have mentioned, there is plenty of jurisprudence at the European Court level under the, um, the, the, the questions of whether or not hate speech and incitement speech constitute um, a, a legitimate restriction to freedom of expression. Um, in order to, to look at hate speech and incitement speech, the European Court has two options. The most common option is to look at Article 10 and to determine whether the speech in questions constitute a legitimate restriction under Article 10 of the, um, of the European Convention. So that's the three-part test. But the European uh, Court and the European Convention uh, as a different option, which has been rarely used, but has been used sometimes. And that's Article 17 of the European Convention, which provide, and I quote, that nothing in this convention may be interpreted as implying for any state, group, or person any right to engage in any activities or perform any act aimed at the destruction of any of the rights and freedoms set forth in the, in the Convention. Article 17 basically states that um, if the action or the speech is so grave and so dangerous, there is no way that speech could be tolerated. And in fact, that speech cannot be at all considered under Article 10 of uh, the European Convention. Usually, historically, uh, the um, European Court has used Article 17 for speech that were immediately uh, in the years after World War II, over the last uh, decades after World War II, uh, speech that were virulently anti-Semitic. And you can understand uh, the context. It's Europe, it's um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years after uh, after the war, 
Uh, there are still plenty of examples of anti-Semitism, indeed, there are still plenty now. Uh, but it has rarely used that Article 17 in recent years. It did so, though, last year, in the case of Mbala Mbala versus France. And so, in that particular case, the, the European Court ruled against uh, Mr. Zurek and for the Turkish government and clearly stated that incitement to violence uh, amounted to a legitimate uh, restriction to uh, freedom of expression. So when you look back at the various jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights, you will see that a, a number of issues come out and they are on your screen at the moment. The European Court throughout its jurisprudence have kind of systematically placed the emphasis on various issues. First, the intent of the speaker. Uh, what, what does the speaker intend to do when it is speaking in the way it is speaking? The content of the expression itself, the text uh, of the expression, what does it say? The status of the speaker and his or her influence on society. The status of persons targeted by the remark, the, 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 the groups, the individual, the communities. The forms of disseminations, a single leaflet versus mass media. And of course, the context that, uh, that is surrounding the, the speech, the context of the speech. And so out of the various uh, jurisprudence that we can find at international and regional level, as well as national level, it is possible to extract a number of key elements to hate speech. These are elements that are uh, constitutive to hate speech and for some of them to incitement speech. So in all consideration, we need to take into account the context of the speech. Is there a history of violence, of discrimination, of censorship? Second, we need to take into account the speaker and his or her influence over the society. Can he or she influence its audience? The speech itself, is there a direct call for the audience to act in a certain way? Is it inflammatory? Is it coded? The medium used, is it public, frequent, massive, or are we dealing, uh, on the other hand, with just a single leaflet? Who is the target group? Is this a community that has been historically targeted? Is there a history of violence? against them or against those individuals. And then finally, the audience. How large is it? How responsive is it to the speech? Does it have the means to act on the speech? Does it have the means to understand the speech and to understand that it may be a direct call to commit violence or indeed discrimination? In addition, incitement may also require the, the a focus on the intention to incite. Are we dealing with uh, someone who is directly inciting others to commit a crime, or is it somebody who is simply put reckless? Is there a, a causal link that may be established between the speech and a prescribed result? Violence, possibly terrorism, discrimination or hostility. And as importantly, what is the likelihood that the action will result from the speech? And is that action, that act of violence or discrimination, being imminent as compared to uh, very far away in the future? These are a range of, of questions and elements that um, form part of what constitute incitement speech and for some of them of what constitute uh, hate speech. In conclusion, we have explored in this segment and indeed the previous one, a common legitimate restriction to freedom of expression that is referred to as incitement speech and as hate speech. I have ultimately distinguished the two forms of speech and insisted that 
incitement speech constitute a particularly egregious form of speech that international provisions and indeed regional uh, provisions have identified as being a particularly legitimate uh, form of restriction to freedom of expression. Courts around the world have all agreed that incitement, and in particular incitement to violence, in almost all uh, cases will constitute a legitimate restriction to freedom of expression because of its potential impact on um, individuals and communities, on um, peace and tolerance, on non-discrimination, on equality, and ultimately on dignity. See you next time.